And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I uh, was doing a little legal research this uh, week, and I came across a few laws that many of you may not be aware of. Uh, there is a town where it's illegal to sell a pickle that doesn't bounce. And apparently, at least two people have been uh, charged and fined for selling pickles that were too floppy. There's also a, uh, a place in uh, Arizona where it's illegal to let a donkey sleep in a bathtub. So if you should ever be in that part of Arizona, you want to be careful about that. There is a, a town in Washington where it's illegal to hunt Bigfoot. And there's a, they also put him on the endangered species list. Uh, not that I'm anti-Bigfoot. I think you should believe in yourself even when no one else does. But uh, these laws seem so very silly. Now, they were all enacted for reasons that made sense at the time, but mm, no longer do. And we find in the Holy Scriptures, too, uh, rules that are 3,000 years old that, well, they don't really apply to us very much. And uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to try to, you know, organize our thinking around, you know, uh, a 3,000-year-old legal code and then today's challenges. Well, Jesus had you know, the same sort of, uh, of conundrum that he had to deal with. And sometimes he did not do what everybody thought was the rules. Uh, he would not obey the rabbinic interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, he did obey all the Old Testament rules, but he, he didn't uh, do it the way that everyone thought he should. And there are times uh, throughout his ministry where people ask him questions about this kind of thing, and then he gives insightful answers. <clears throat> this is just one such case. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A good question, uh, one that Jesus is constantly answering, <clears throat> and he answers it a little bit differently depending on the circumstances of what, what that person seems to need, uh, what that person um, you know, is, is, is struggling with, wrestling with at the time, because uh, all of us have, you know, different answers to life's questions as we go through life and, and are facing uh, different kinds of challenges. So he bounces the question back. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? So a lot of times uh, the best way of counseling someone is to, to ask them the right question, help them to figure out, you know, what it is that, uh, uh, you know, they really need to be doing rather than just give them the pat answer or the, the answer that you know from the Bible or you know, something that just sounds nice. You know, it's helpful when they engage, when they make the decision to go forward, then it's, it works better. It works better because it's their decision. The uh, lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. These uh, are also given in Matthew 22 out of Jesus' mouth, a very almost exactly the same wording. But the idea is, you know, that love is the center of the law. That's what all the other laws hang on. And when you have a law that following it would break the law of love, then that law doesn't really make any sense right now. And that's really how we usually do our law codes. And, you know, so when you have a law in the books that's ridiculous, most people kind of ignore it, and uh, life goes on. And, and when those uh, laws make sense, and they are, you know, in, in harmony with the way that we think about how law should work, well, of course, everyone you know, sees the need and, and moves forward with that. Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. Seems like it should be a short, open and closed conversation there, but of course, uh, the lawyer has more questions, and that's sort of the nature of <clears throat> someone who is curious uh, and intellectual like this fellow. So he asks another question. What did he justify himself? He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then <clears throat> Jesus tells a story, a story that is in our law code. If you've ever heard of a Good Samaritan law, it comes from this story that if you stop to help somebody and things don't go the way that you expected, you can't be sued for it. And it's not exactly like that, but that's the intention of a Good Samaritan law. And it comes from this story that Jesus is telling in response to the question, 
who is my neighbor? And so he tells a story of a man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So apparently he looked dead. And, and the reason I say that is because of what happens next. And now by chance a priest was going down that road and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now why would they do that? Well, there's a couple of practical reasons. Uh, for instance, uh, sometimes uh, a robber would leave uh, somebody in the road to lure you over there where they could get you. But more likely, the reason it even specifically mentions the priest and the Levite is because there is conflicting rules. The rule that the priests and Levites were under, one of them was, you know, don't touch a dead body because it makes you unclean. And if they're going to Jerusalem to serve, then they'll be unclean for so many days that, you know, they might as well turn around and go home if they touch a dead body. And they don't know if this guy is dead or not. But there's, it's conflicting with a much more important rule, the law of love, which they also we're well aware of. Love your neighbors yourself is from Leviticus, not just the New Testament, although it appears in the New Testament a couple times. And so there's a conflict, and both the priest and the Levite decide on the, on the side of uh, you know, the small laws, the little laws, the thousands of, of little regulations and rules and so forth that sometimes we can hide behind rather than do the tough work of a, of really seeing uh, the big picture and obeying the law of love. Because, of course, if you see someone who is in this kind of bad situation, immediate aid is absolutely the right thing to do. It, it should be unquestionable that that's the right thing to do, unless, of course, you're this priest and Levite who just decide to pass on by. Now, there's an interesting story from my seminary days. Um, <clears throat> uh, a professor was relating... Uh, the case of uh, uh, a class that had been assigned a paper on the Good Samaritan parable. And they, uh, uh, the five best papers in the class were told to take their paper and go present it to the trustees of the seminary. A very big deal. And the, uh, they were told where to go, and along the path from where they were to the place where they were supposed to go talk to the trustees was a man lying there who appeared to be drunk and injured. All five people walk right past him and deliver their speech on the Good Samaritan parable. Because it's very easy for us to get things in our mind that seem to be oh so very important, uh, but we sometimes miss the simpler questions of love, the simpler questions of, of helping uh, people who are in need. That, that can never be right. That can never be excused on our behalf. We, we, we must see that there is a need to help when an opportunity like that presents itself. And of course, you know, there's pretty unlikely that most of us are going to see, you know, someone who's half dead along the road from robbers, maybe, but most of the time our chances to help are much less dramatic and uh, much, uh, much easier to handle, too, because most of us don't have enough medical knowledge to help that much. The best we could do is maybe call 911 or something like that in a, in a situation that the Samaritan gets himself into. But the Samaritan, of course, is in a time before all that, and so he feels the need to do something directly. A Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. He put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now, we associate Samaritan with good guy because of this story. That's not what the lawyer would have thought. The guy who asked this question originally about, well, who's my neighbor? Uh, Samaritans were considered you know, uh, to be outcasts, half-breeds, uh, bad people, and, and, you know, just uh, altogether uh, wrong-headed about religion, you know, and, and just the, the two cultures didn't mix. And so, again, and Jesus does this a lot, he's challenging our notion of who's in, who's out, because the Samaritan recognizes that love is the most important thing, and he automatically does this without discussing the theology of it at all, whereas the lawyer apparently needs a lot of work, you know, theologically in order to get to the place where he's comfortable doing something like this, and we still don't know, even at the end of the story, 
would he really do this? Would he really help the man who was in need? Or, or would he pass by on the other side too? We really never get to information like that about the lawyer. But we know this Samaritan's heart, this, uh, you know, this person who's an outcast, this person who is a, of another race, uh, another religion from the Jews, uh, yeah, at least partially, and, uh, and you know, that, that person is held up as the hero of the story, but the lawyer, oh man, he didn't really want to uh, think of it that way. In fact, when Jesus asked him the question at the end of the story, which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the robbers? He couldn't even say, the lawyer couldn't even say, the Samaritan. He says, the one who showed him mercy. So he answers the question. I mean, he, he gets the right answer, that obviously the right thing to do is to help when you see someone in need. Uh, but he still can't get past the, you know, the racial problem that he has with Samaritans. He can't even speak the name. And so, you know, it's, it's a tough lesson for this guy. But at least there he is in front of Jesus asking the right questions. We don't know if he absorbed those answers and changed his life and, you know, and lived out the principles of Jesus. Nor do I know how any of you will receive this information or whether I myself, though I can impart it, you know, faithfully, I'm going to live it out in my own life. That remains to be seen. You know, Jesus' rules, uh, Jesus' focus on love, I think they're fairly clear. I think the task in front of us is usually fairly clear, you know, that we should be living out this life of love. We should be willing to extend ourselves, sacrifice, uh, even take a risk in order to help those who are needy. And we should see that all the little rules that uh, seem to govern our lives, all these small priorities that suddenly jump up and become urgent, can be very much a distraction. Yes, of course, there's times to obey the rules just because they're the rules and we don't even understand why. But there is another time to recognize that love is the most important rule and that our ability to, to step outside of ourselves and do what is right in those moments really defines who we are as Christians. Because most of the time, you know, we're in these comfort zones and we can hide behind just studying the Bible rather than living it out. You know, both are necessary, but the living it out is where the rubber really meets the road. It's so easy for us to just be in that place where everything's safe and okay. But that's not where <clears throat> the mission of Jesus Christ really gets done. The mission of Jesus Christ is in us helping those who, who are in need, and whether we do that uh, personally or through a community outreach or <clears throat> in, in whatever way we find that we can do that, it's necessary for us to do that as Christians. It's necessary for us to take uh, those kind of risks, to make those kind of priorities in our lives. When we do those kinds of things, we are living out the kingdom of God. We are proclaiming our faith. Sometimes we proclaim our faith in actions, and sometimes we proclaim our faith in words. <clears throat> but either way, it is to the glory of God that we share our faith and live out the law of love in our lives in such a way that all can see it and can live out an example of who Jesus Christ is in our lives through their lives. Amen.